Hey everyone, welcome back. Look, SpaceX ended 2025 with some pretty wild numbers. 165 Falcon launches, 5 Starship flights, Dragon running flawless missions while literally every competitor ran into problems. On paper, that's incredible. But here's the thing that's been bothering me. 2025 was really about proving they could do these things. 2026. Completely different story. NASA needs orbital refueling demonstrations for Artemis, and those contracts have actual deadlines with billions attached. The Air Force just approved Starship for national security missions at LC-37. Starlink V-3 can't launch without operational Starship, and Amazon's not sitting still. So the question that keeps me up at night can they actually make this jump from test program to operational system while keeping everything else running? Or are we about to watch them hit a wall nobody's willing to talk about publicly? All right, let's talk about NASA first, because this one's got real consequences. The Artemis contract is worth $2.89 billion, and buried in there are specific milestones SpaceX has to hit in 2026. The biggest? Orbital refueling. Nobody's ever done this successfully. Nobody. You're trying to transfer super-cold liquid methane and oxygen between two vehicles moving at 17,500 miles per hour in the vacuum of space. The propellants behave completely differently in microgravity. You've got boil-off eating your fuel supply. The docking has to be millimeter precise while both ships are expanding and contracting from thermal stress. Now, this is where 2025 starts to matter. Those last two Starship flights. They proved in-space engine relight works. That might not sound sexy, but without that, you can't do the orbital ballet needed for refueling. Can't maneuver for rendezvous. Can't hold position during transfer. The whole concept collapses. They also deployed payloads twice, which means they can actually put that fuel depot up there. These weren't the flashy catches that went viral. These were the unsexy engineering fundamentals that everything else depends on. But did 2025 prove they're ready for the actual refueling demo? Honestly? No. It proved they've cleared the prerequisites. That's very different from solving the main problem. And here's what worries me. If they miss this milestone, NASA doesn't have a plan B. None. Artemis III gets delayed, and we're talking about geopolitical implications with China's lunar program that nobody wants to say out loud on camera. The pressure gets worse when you realize who else is counting on these deadlines. During 2025, the Department of Defense officially approved Starship operations at Launch Complex 37 in Florida. That's not symbolic. The military is planning to fly national security payloads on Starship, probably starting late 2026, maybe early 2027. And the military doesn't work like commercial customers. They don't accept, we're making progress, or the data looks encouraging. They need demonstrated repeatable reliability before they'll put classified satellites worth hundreds of millions on your rocket. Five test flights with mixed results. That doesn't cut it for DOD certification. The last two flights showed real improvement. Both ships made it through re-entry and splashed down successfully after the V-2 configuration nearly killed the program with three straight failures. But real improvement and ready for national security missions are separated by a pretty significant gap. And think about the cadence problem. Falcon 9 just proved again it can fly 165 times a year with better reliability than 2024. But Falcon had a decade to build that muscle memory. Starship is being asked to compress that entire learning curve into maybe 18 months. The Air Force is betting SpaceX can pull it off, but you can bet they've got contingency plans they're not sharing with us. 
Here's where it gets interesting, though. The timeline pressure isn't just government contracts. SpaceX has its own commercial deadline that might be just as critical. Starlink Phi-3. Right now, the constellation runs on satellites weighing about 1,200 pounds each. Falcon 9 can haul those up efficiently, which is why they've launched over 10,000 of them with 9,000 still operational. But V3 satellites? We're talking 4,000 to 5,000 pounds each. Bigger phased arrays, more powerful laser inter-satellite links. Falcon 9 physically can't deploy meaningful numbers of these. Starship isn't nice to have for V3. It's mandatory. SpaceX said they want 12,000 satellites in orbit by the end of 2026. If V3 deployment actually starts next year, like they're planning, Starship needs to be launching operationally by mid-year at the latest. And we're not talking about one or two demo missions. We're talking about operational tempo, maybe one Starlink launch every two to three weeks by December. That's a completely different animal from test flights. The business pressure here is real. Amazon's Kuiper launched their production satellites, and they're ramping towards service. OneWeb keeps expanding. Starlink generated over $6 billion in revenue in 2025, and that money funds Starship development. Any delay in V3 deployment doesn't just slow down the constellation. It potentially lets competitors close the gap in coverage and capacity. For a company betting its future on staying ahead in space internet, that's existential. So with all this pressure building, what did they actually accomplish in 2025 that makes any of this seem possible? Flight rate went from 4 to 5. Sounds incremental. But each flight generated way more useful data than the one before. The jump to V2 configuration looked like a disaster at first. Three flights in a row with serious enough problems to lose the ship. I remember watching those and thinking, did they just take a step backward? But here's what they did that I genuinely respect. They didn't pause. They didn't form a committee. After each failure, they analyzed it, made changes, and flew again faster than most aerospace companies can even schedule a review meeting. By flights 9 and 10, that same V2 configuration that nearly killed the program was surviving full re-entry and making controlled splashdowns. They deliberately pulled heat shield tiles off to test failure modes, tried new metallic thermal protection, found it oxidized too much, dumped it, and moved to the crunch wrap tile technique instead. That's real engineering happening in public, not PowerPoint. The booster progress was cleaner. Flights 7 and 8 both caught successfully with Mechazilla, and the boosters came back in noticeably better shape than the first catch on Flight 5. They flew Raptor Pi 314 multiple times, proving engine reuse actually works. Tested landing at higher angles of attack. Tested landing with fewer engines firing. Each test expanded what the vehicle can handle. These aren't party tricks. You can't turn boosters in days if you can't catch them reliably and if the engines are disposable after one flight. Then there's the production story that genuinely shocked me. Booster 18 exploded in December. Most of us, including me, I'll admit it, expected a multi-month delay while they investigated and built a replacement. Standard aerospace timeline would be six months minimum. SpaceX delivered Booster 19 in 28 days. Not months. Days. When the program started, building a Super Heavy took six to eight months. Even with the production line mature, three to four months was considered fast. They just proved they can do it in under a month when they need to. That changes everything about what's possible in 2026. And it's happening right as their infrastructure expansion hits a critical point. Starbase has Pad 2 almost ready, while Pad 1 gets converted for V3 testing. Two pads mean you can prep one vehicle while launching another, potentially doubling your flight rate right there. In Florida, they're modifying LC-39A for Starship 
and they acquired LC-37 with Air Force approval. Do the math. Three different launch pads across two states potentially operational by late 2026. Why would you spend billions on that infrastructure unless your internal projections for flight rate are way higher than what you're saying publicly? Meanwhile, the system that's actually keeping the lights on and paying the bills keeps getting better. Falcon 9 didn't just match 2024's performance. It beat it. 165-plus launches with improved reliability metrics. Booster B-1067 hit 32 total flights, including 8 just in 2025. The idea of a single booster flying 40 missions used to be science fiction. Now it's probably happening this year. Dragon's story is even more important than the raw numbers suggest. Seven perfect missions, five crew, two cargo, while every single competitor ran into problems, Starliners still grounded from 2024's issues. Dream Chaser keeps sliding toward late 2026. Russia's dealing with pad constraints. China's Shenzhou program hit debris problems. Dragon became the only reliable crew vehicle to ISS. NASA's reportedly planning to increase Dragon's flight rate just to cover for everyone else's delays. That reliability track record is why anyone believes SpaceX's 2026 Starship commitments are possible instead of delusional. When they tell NASA they can demonstrate orbital refueling, NASA believes them because Dragon's been flawless. When the Air Force approves national security missions, they're betting on a company with Falcon 9's reliability record. The question was never whether SpaceX can execute complex missions. They've proven that over and over. The real question is whether they can scale Starship from five test flights to operational status fast enough to meet commitments that carry billion-dollar price tags and national strategic consequences. So can they actually pull this off in 2026? Here's my honest take. They've built the technical foundation. Relight works, payload deployment is proven, boosters catch reliably, and that 28-day production turnaround proved they can recover from setbacks faster than anyone thought possible. But there's a big difference between proving concepts and executing under contract with billions on the line and national programs depending on you. I think they've got a realistic shot at hitting the major milestones. But realistic doesn't mean guaranteed. The margin for error is razor thin. One major failure during orbital refueling demos could cascade across multiple programs. That's what happens when you become this critical to American space infrastructure. Your successes accelerate everything, but your failures affect way more than just your company. What do you think? Which deadline worries you most? NASA's refueling demo, those Air Force missions, or getting Starlink V3 deployed before Kuiper closes the gap? Let me know in the comments. And if this breakdown helped you understand what's actually at stake this year, do me a favor. Hit that like button and subscribe to New Space Review. We're going to be following every one of these milestones as they happen, and I don't want you to miss any of it. Share this with anyone tracking SpaceX's progress, because 2026 is the year we find out if rapid reusability actually works at operational scale. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.